Hello everyone uh, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Miles Anderson. Uh, I run a company called Bright Local. I am joined by four um, renowned Google Local experts today who also happen to be Google top contributors, which means they know an awful lot about today's topic, which is Google My Business. And specifically, we're looking at strategies and ranking factors to do with Google My Business. Um, move the slide deck on. Um, we actually, it's actually the second webinar uh, in a kind of two-part series. Last week, we looked at troubleshooting uh, Google My Business issues. We tackled around 22 questions uh, in a great amount of detail. And if you missed that webinar, we haven't seen the recording, uh, you can access that on the Bright Local blog. It's fantastic. I certainly learned a lot from it, and the response we got on Twitter was incredible. So please do check that out. But in today's webinar, we are looking specifically at strategy and ranking factors, and I'm delighted uh, that we have our four panelists with us today, because um, I think truly, you know, across the globe, there aren't many people who know more about this particular topic than the four people uh, that we have with us today. So we have a lot to get through. So I'm just going to jump in there and start uh, on the first question. So, uh, sorry, before I do that, I should let you know that we actually had over 120 questions for today's webinar, which is an awful lot for us to get through. This thank you very much to everyone who submitted their questions. What we've done is looked for kind of commonalities and similar questions and kind of grouped them together in a kind of five-part agenda. First, we're going to look at questions relating to the algorithm and also to the possum uh, update slash filter. Then we're going to look at strategy for GMB. Then we're going to look at pay-to-play issues uh, around Google My Business and uh, kind of Google Maps. We're going to look at ranking factors uh, and what's changing uh, in that regard. And then we're going to look at kind of the more advanced Google My Business features. So let's deal uh, with um, the algorithm and possible update first. We, are, we do have a particular, a special Twitter handle for this, which is uh, GMB Webinar. So if you want to follow this on Twitter, you want to collaborate, contribute, start a conversation, please use that hashtag. Uh, if you're going to do so, and we'll also be tweeting uh, as we go along. We also are manning uh, the, the Q&A chat. We have uh, Kona Nielsen, who works with Joy at Sterling Sky, uh, who's helping us answer a number of the questions, and maybe some of the panelists will jump on uh, the kind of chat Q&A uh, as well. So please put your questions there, and we'll do our best to answer as many of those as possible. So, algorithm and possum. The first question, and uh, Joy, I'm going to put this to you. What are the best steps to take to get a legitimate business that's been filtered by Possum to become unfiltered? Yeah, so this is something that I've done um, quite a bit of work on. Um, I've had lots of businesses that have contacted me that have been filtered. Usually they're um, businesses that are in the same building as another business in the same industry. So uh, case we see this a lot for lawyers. We've got like a big skyscraper down in the middle of the city and there's 15 lawyers in the same building. So often Google will pick the one that is ranking highest organically. So the biggest thing that um, people often, I guess, don't look at is they are, you know, obsessing about the local ranking, but they're not actually looking to see how they're doing organically. And there's a connection between the two. So often the business that's ranking highest organically will be the one that Google picks and then filters all the rest. So it's, I would say, crucial to make sure that you're um, focusing on signals that impact organic like links and on-site optimization and things like that. Um, the other main thing that I see is uh, category association. So often cases, the business is literally just not using the correct category. They're using one that's kind of similar, but not the one that Google's looking for. So um, one example I think that uh, had this happen was a physical therapy uh, clinic that was using like physical therapy clinic and when they actually needed to use physical therapist as the category. Those are probably the top two things I would say. So how does so um, so obviously there's there's some ways to do that. I mean, are you advising that a business reconsiders its category, and is that making sure it's the right category or a category that's different from the other businesses at that same location? No, you actually want to look at the ranking businesses and see what they're using. Um, so you'd want it to be the same as the businesses that are ranking you, especially whoever it is that got you filtered. Like it's important to identify who that is. Um, so if it's you know your two attorneys in the same building and it's the other attorney that is ranking, um, it's really important to look at what they're doing better than you. Like kind of map out which signals that they're beating you at. Like do they have better reviews? Do they have a better organic ranking? What categories are they using? And really like do a deep analysis on um, that particular business. Okay, and and for a bit of I guess sort of a bit of unclarity and understanding of why Google does this, what what can you share with the audience to, so they can understand 
why legitimately good businesses that maybe just aren't the best optimized businesses are being treated in this manner by Google. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, Google's doing it to help remove duplicate listings because a lot of times, you know, there'll be one business that has four or five listings, and this actually keeps the four or five listings from all ranking and kind of monopolizing the results. So it does a really good job of that. I think that's the design a reason for it. But unfortunately, you know, the unwanted consequence is that it can filter out other businesses that are not related as well if they're at the same address. Okay, great, Joy. That's really good, um, Joel. I'm going to come to you next. And for those of you who uh, who weren't on the last week's webinar, um, Joel actually worked at Google uh, for 11 years, so um, he's got a kind of unique set of insights, you know, around uh, around that kind of geo product. So, Joel, you know, what's your what's your take on why Google is doing this? And do you think that do you think they're doing it in a good way? And do you think that way will change? Um. I, so to answer the last question first, I hope so, uh, because the second question is I'm not sure it's a great way. So in general, Google wants to list the most, the best businesses uh, first, and what happens with filtering is that you end up, uh, if all the best businesses happen to be in the same building, I work with a lot of medical practices who office, who share the kind of medical building office space, and what happens is you get. Uh, result number one in front of five results that might be the top five if they weren't doing this, right? So, so you get them stacked behind and hidden behind this filter and um, you, you aren't necessarily seeing the best result uh, that, that could be returned based on the other signals we typically talk about in local. So I don't, I don't think it's a great result. I think Google is doing this because they, there's a sense of improving the aesthetic. Um, Google has moved away from uh, demonstrating their comprehensiveness, and for a long time, comprehensiveness was a very big deal. I think Google, in all of its measures, found that they had the most comprehensive um, listing index uh, from anybody else on the web. And they showed that back in the day with those measles, um, which kind of gotten into trouble when you search for locksmiths in New York or something like that. But you, you had these little pinpoint dots all over the map, and they wanted to demonstrate their comprehensiveness. Now they're really uh, optimizing, I think, for speed and uh, ease of use, which uh, I think takes a backward step in connecting you with the best business possible. Um, and, and like Joy said, there's we typically think of uh, it's so important to get in the three pack. If you do, if you win in either content or links or other or proximity and reviews, you can you can probably get in that group of three. Like you don't have to win in all those groupings, but you can probably get there. And when you're looking at filtered businesses, you need to look like Joy said at that. That, that listing that's getting you filtered and seeing what they're winning on and then having to compete toe to toe on that aspect. That's very interesting. So essentially if you're able to identify which business is the cause of your filter, you know, that gives you a great benchmark for which to try and get your own business or your client's business, you know, up to scratch to kind of match them toe to toe uh, in terms of optimization. Yeah. Exceed beat them, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, next question. Uh, is there a way to force a manual review of the possum filter? Uh, and kind of going deeper than that, do Google employees have the power to adjust individual scenarios or listings, or does that mean entire change the entire algorithm? Uh, I guess, Joel, given your kind of you know your time at Google, maybe maybe you're best to pick up on this first. Uh, no, they don't. Um, uh, too many Christmas, is that me? Um, no, they don't. They don't have an ability to do that. They, uh, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, so, so um, uh, the people in charge of the local listing algorithm are um, uh, not simply, there's not simply a wall between those that are doing manual edits um, uh, and those that are in charge of the algorithm, there's almost, there's like a demilitarized zone. I mean, they have their guns pointed at these people. And when everybody, anybody tries to converse 
with people that work on the algorithm. They're like, leave us alone. You can't talk to us. Don't try to influence us. So it's, it's, it, there is this real sense of we need to be independent of any manual work. Like if they do, that's different than if they do evals to see if their local updates, how they change ranking and how they change quality of search results. But really for individual listings, they just don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> Okay, great. That, that's fascinating insight. Thanks, Joel. Um, how about in the forum? Is there any is there any sort of use or value in submitting kind of requests or issues uh, into the GMB forum uh, to kind of get those looked at, um, or is it simply a case of just focus on focus on improving the signals that the winning business is 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 winning at, uh, and focus your effort on those? Joy, again, Dr. Yeah, I mean we get posts on the forum about this all the time. The problem is, is there are, you know, hundreds of posts on the forum, I don't know, in a given week. And usually, you know, I try to spend like maybe five to ten minutes on each thread um, at most. And you really can't diagnose or offer much helpful advice by looking at something for five to ten minutes. So if a business is really looking and stuck um, in a situation like this, that's where I would say, you know, go hire someone to do an audit or, you know, help you um, if it's making that much of an impact to your business. Um, that's what I would suggest doing. Definitely you can get some good advice on the forum, just keep it with a grain of salt because you know five to ten minutes of looking at something isn't going to really accomplish a ton of actionable advice. Okay, great. Guys, again, thank you. Uh, that's really good insight to uh, for the audience. Um, okay, let's go on to the, the next question. So um, this one uh, was, uh, was phrased pretty much like this. You know, I work with private healthcare providers. Uh, we often see um, kind of unclaimed GMB listings outranking what they describe as well-optimized businesses, you know, lots of reviews, photos, posts, that all have their website uh, ranking well organically. Um, so how does this happen? How does a kind of seemingly unloved, unknown, untended to GMB listing end up actually outperforming one that have, has, has gone through a kind of best practice procedure? Um, Mike, let's come to you for this. So. One, there's a misconception that somehow claiming a listing or verifying a listing increases your rank. It doesn't. I mean, Google wants you to do that because that means the information will be fresher. So just because you've claimed the listing or and or put a photo up there, I mean, it's from a ranking point of view, it's irrelevant. The ranking algorithm is, I think, a very a beautiful thing, but it's trimodal. By that I mean there's three parts to it: proximity, relevance, and prominence. And they each have their own metric, and they can be combined for a single view. And in any given industry, in any given city, from any given location that you are searching, you might find that one or the other of those causes one or the other of the business listings to rank. And so Google looks at a lot of signals that aren't visible via the GMB listing, web, like Joy pointed out, web page strength or third-party reviews, or maybe the, the business has a really high-performing listing at a doctor service that's influencing the rank of the entity. So there's a lot that goes on in the algorithm that isn't visible to you or me, even in, in this context. So I think the, answer, the question is a little bit naive. It doesn't respect the fact that, that Google looks a lot of places to rank and that the ranking algorithm has multiple aspects to it. So that's a great answer, Mike, and a lot of detail. If I could just kind of drill into the uh, the kind of trimodal point you made at the start, just could you could you just kind of break those three pieces out um, uh, in sure. terms of really exactly kind of what they mean and if you have a sense of if either has a, a weighting over another? So a proximity is become the distance between the searcher and the business. Typically, we're searching on mobile phones. Google knows where you're at, and they want to show businesses that are close to you in most industries. Now, it depends a lot on the density of the industry, but let's assume uh, most of the time they want to show you things that are closest to you. And it's a very powerful signal. Um, it's the number one ranking signal, unless it isn't, right? Um, I mean, the reality of proximity is that Sometimes it's the most important thing and sometimes it isn't. Relevance is the idea of a categorical categorization of the listing. 
although in the era of semantic search it's a broader it's broader than that so it's all of the signals that Google uses to understand what a business does it's the category it's the category of third party sites it's a category of Google it's the it's the content of reviews it's the business name uh, it's the content of your website it's link anchor anchor text and links these are the things that Google looks at to understand what your business does and whether you're eligible to be in that search and then prominence is assuming all of the things are equal uh, you know proximity is equal relevance is equal it's sort of a tiebreaker at some level although I don't in a sense it's not the least important sometimes it's the most important it basically is how popular are you in the context of this search and Google, you know, coming out of the web world, still uses links in local, but there are other metrics in local. Top 10 lists from critics, for example, or other preferred lists have an influence. Reviews have an influence. Uh, you know, reviews on the web have an influence. So uh, there's a number. I don't. We don't know all the factors that Google uses to determine prominence. So, but they work together, and then. My, in reading the patent, assuming it still works this way, they each have a metric, but then Google normalizes those metrics between them so they can all appear on the same scale and then adds them up and picks one, two, or three businesses to show. So one of the three factors being proximity, um, there's really not much you can do to influence that, correct? Well, you, you have to realize that, I mean, I. You can't influence proximity to the searcher because you don't know where the searcher is, right? So that being said, the other signals can outweigh it if they're strong enough in a given search. Um, I think one of the things that people don't realize, though, is that searchers move through the environment these days, right? They're not sitting at a desktop doing the search. They're not a ranking, a, a ranking tool doing the search. People are moving. It's like slices of bread in a loaf. Right? It's a multi-dimensional thing. And to me, the issue is, are you getting your fair share of results? It's not dominating this phrase. It's, are we functioning well compared to last year or compared to last quarter? Are we seeing an uptick or, or not? And I think the issue is that ranking has become some sort of key performance indicator, and it's not a real good one. The best one is, is the phone ringing? Are people walking in the door due to the work you're doing on mobile? or do in, in, in digital. And I think some of the issue is that ranking diverts attention from the real issue of getting customers. Um, the next question we had, I think we pretty much covered. Um, let's go back up. Uh, what signals have, 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 have the biggest impact on the local algorithm? And how have these changed in the last 12 months? And maybe we should focus on the kind of change aspect to, uh, to that. Um, ben. Let's bring you in uh, for, the, uh, for your, uh, your kind of first question today. Um, Absolutely. Bringing in from what kind of Mike's uh, and Joy were discussing then, um, you know, which signals do you see having the biggest impact, and how have you seen those change uh, in the last 12 months? You know, <clears throat> um, Mike brought up a, a really great word that I think is, is not talked about enough when it comes to search. And that is, is that, that we are in this kind of semantic search age. And when we're looking at semantics, basically what Google's looking at is, is they're looking for meaning. Um, you know, the word semantic actually comes from the Greek word for meaning. And when we're looking at meaning, we're also trying to take a look uh, very deeply at trust. So how can Google really trust that an entity is what it is? Um, and one of the ways that you can do that is by basically tying all the different pieces of facts that are scattered around the web, whether that be maybe Wikipedia, which is not always the most trustworthy source, but other articles, say on Forbes, Inc., Business to Community, um, any type of authoritative website. And tying those pieces of data basically back to your local entity uh, this can be done in multiple ways. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, you know, any kind of blog content that you have, that, uh, that is one piece that you can really control. Uh, making sure that the data points that are within Google My Business line up with all of your citations and also with what other people are saying in the world. Uh, there was a case study that Mike did, for instance, about Yelp and reviews and how that can kind of impact search. Um, some other case studies that have been done too is around like using Google Plus for instance, using that as a way to really in a sense manually inputting data to Google 
you know, one of their own properties. And the, having that data tie back to all of the other nodes of kind of information and then having that information in a sense validated by users. Um, uh, we've kind of seen this also recently as TCs have kind of been doing some tests around even the Google Posts and we've seen some pretty promising results around that. So I, I guess in a nutshell is, is to start thinking about the semantic aspects of your business. How accurate is that data around the web? What kind of interaction are you getting around that kind of data? And how are you building your trust basically with Google? Okay, Ben, that's great, thank you. Um, pretty much time, let's move on to the uh, second section, which is strategy. Um, first question is, um, and I'm gonna to come to, Ben, I'm gonna stay with you uh, for this question, Ben. Uh, my business ranks well in searches in my city, but in nearby cities, we don't rank at all. How can I get ranked in cities that are adjacent to mine? And this is probably the most common question that we had for all the questions submitted for this in various different guises. This was the, a real bugbear for so many business owners uh, and, uh, and SEOs out there. So um, Ben, what's your, what's your answer to that? Well, I hate to do this, but the answer is kind of similar to the last question. Um, we've seen this actually a lot. We've seen this across hundreds of listings that, that we manage. Um, and one of the techniques that we utilize is, is like, again, going back to Google+, Plus, is we found that um, by inserting uh, in a honest way, um, the hashtags basically for the different types of cities that you that you uh, do service, or even using sometimes a hashtag with a zip code, or just mentioning the city itself within the context of, a, say, a Google post, right? Um, but also having this, again, the same information mirrored along blog posts. We've seen that we've been able to kind of get a basically influence the relevance of a Google My Business listing just by using semantic search type of techniques. So does that influence, um, that is, does that influence the proximity score or does that influence the, the relevance score there uh, when you're doing it? And what other places have you tried doing that particular tactic and, and seen, seen the needle move? I mean, I've seen it, it absolutely helps with relevance. Proximity, I think, is the most difficult thing to do because, like Mike was saying, people are moving. They're moving around, you know. So if you're looking for, say, pizza near me, you know, it's going to bring up the pizza hut that's near you. Um, if you're in an adjacent city and you say pizza near me, you want, your intent is to find, you know, a good place for pizza near you. You're not going to want to see that it's, say, 10 miles away, you want to see something that's within a half a mile to a mile from you. And that's what Google wants. Google wants to show you the bright information that is, is right near to you, basically. Um, okay, Mike, maybe come to you on this one. And how, how, how does this work, not for, for physical businesses, let's say service area businesses that have vans that crisscross and across an entire large sort of city metropolitan area, but they have a single depot in a particular kind of suburb. You know, these guys are legitimately servicing a wider area but not getting visibility in those areas. Right, so the first assumption in this question is that Google owes them marketing coverage in their local listings. Google doesn't owe them anything, right? So that, one, I think there's a, a wrong assumption. But they could open an office in the adjacent city, a legitimate, real office. They could open they could open a fake one too. You know, obviously it's a high risk strategy, but it probably would work. Um, they could take out AdWords, and particularly Google AdWords Express allows you to target down to zip codes very accurately. Um, and in, in HSAs, um, I think the HSA now allows you to target uh, ge ge geography beyond your location. And HSA, you know, home service ads are now very prominent. So I think advertising is a real possibility there. From an organic point of view, so uh, uh, you can assassinate all of your competitors. That would clear the field. Um, that's solid SEO strategy. Um, and you could do link building on the city phrase. I think that would probably influence it as well. But I think generally you need to get out of the mindset that just because you want it, it should happen. I mean, obviously there's the reality that Ben talked about. There's the reality of Google and the density in your industry, and it's gonna vary by, by density uh, a 
lot, right? There's some industries, say bartending school, you might get a 30 mile or 50 mile or an 80 mile reach. Other industries like pizza, you're going to have a you know half a mile reach or a mile reach, depending. Lawyers is probably 200 feet. Um, another joke. Sorry, if any lawyers are listening, I apologize. Um, so it's very situational. It's not a question that can be answered really broadly. Uh, Darren and I, just as a note though, did a really not, a good at local U. There's a deep dive into it where we spoke about this topic for about 20, 25 minutes. So if you want to look that up, that might be helpful as well. Okay, great. Yeah, and we'll um, and also there's a uh, bit of a plug for an upcoming uh, local U event that um, uh, I have actually um, sort of seen that piece and read that piece. So. Uh, it, it is really good. So I guess to kind of sort of summarise then, um, in terms of the kind of the sort of semantic opportunities to try and um, you know link your business to locations by by writing content and posting content with certain locations in it, both on your own post but also uh, kind of Google Plus and try and get that within you know the content that's linked to your business. Um, and beyond that, it, it's paying in some capacity then. So it's trying you know kind of AdWords or HSA uh, to target uh, other kind of locations. Or it's actually opening up genuine bona fide offices in those kind of core suburbs um, that you want to, to kind of generate business from. So it sounds like in some capacity you're going to have to pay, uh, whether it's paying Google to, to promote you, or whether it's kind of getting a, a sort of genuine office that you can you can promote from. Um, that seems uh, seems to be the two most kind of direct avenues that you've got to, to explore. Um, next question, uh, and let's go to Joy for this one. Uh, for service area businesses, blacks of plumbers and gardeners. Um, how much does not displaying their address on a GMB listing um, hold back their chances of uh, ranking in the local pack? Yeah, so if you'd asked me this like four months ago, I would have said, you know, it shouldn't make a difference whether you hide your address or not hide your address. Um, however, now I would say it makes a big difference because um, as Google's rolling out home service ads, if you do not have your address displayed, you actually get removed from the local pack. So forget you know, a decrease in ranking, you literally won't be there at all. Um, so what um, we've kind of seen, which is kind of kind of funny, but actually the article I wrote on Search Engine Land that just published today talks about how um, a home-based business could technically still be eligible to show their address if they have proper signage at their home and if they are um, willing to be staffed, I say that in quotes because, I mean, I don't really... So it's kind of like you're not really staffed, but if you're home or you have someone there that's home that could actually uh, address the customer if they showed up at your home address, technically that satisfies Google and they're fine with you showing your address. Um, I think every single SAB needs to be thinking about getting either an actual office or turning their home into a storefront because if HSA is not in their market yet, it probably will be soon and Google is not announcing at all like where they're moving to next. We don't even know when they move into an area. We just discover it. Um, you know, usually Tom will tweet us and be like, hey, I see it in Chicago now, and hey, I see it in New York now, and like Google says nothing. So just assume it's coming. And we're also seeing in markets where there are no home service ads, like carpet cleaning in California with one area. There's no home service ads anywhere, but Google is still removing all the um, hidden addresses from the local results. and. They've completely been silent on why, so I have no idea. Wow, I didn't realize that, Joy. That's really, uh, that's really interesting to, uh, to hear that they're actually kind of taking that dramatic action. Um, Joel, uh, anything you might want to add to, to Joy's comment there? Uh, she's pretty comprehensive. I, I mean, boiling it down, you don't have your address displayed. Uh, you're not going to show up when, once HSAs show up on top of your, in your city. So. Assuming your category is one that's targeted for HSAs, right? Not all SAs are correct. Are correct. This, is, this is specifically in HA, HSAs like plumbers. It is certainly there's if you're if you have HSAs in your city, you're out of the local pack. And we don't yet know if it will be all service area businesses, right? I mean, it's for example, gardeners, which are in the slide, are currently not getting HSAs. As far as I know, yeah. Is there, any, I, is there any definitive list of which uh, industries are covered by HSAs? You know, kind of agnostic of location. Um, 
Is there a it is a diagnostic of location. They seem to have slightly, they're testing it still. So in, right. I did a post on my blog, and certain cities have all of them, and certain cities only have some of them. Uh, locksmiths, I think, are in all, plumbers are in all, but some of the other ones vary by city. Um, so it's on, it, that's on a city by city basis as to which verticals they're covering until such time as the product is finalized and you know global. I think that'll stay that way. Yeah, there is a list that Google has of suggested categories that you can apply, even if they're not available yet. That is probably di directionally accurate in whether they're taking SA HSAs. Yeah, one, one thing it's I would like to add to that is. Yeah. There's a, there's a great article actually on the GMB forums that uh, Tom Waddington recently put up that has kind of a pretty comprehensive list of city by city and also the different categories that are being affected in those cities for home service ads. Okay, if great. You wanna, if, yeah. if you're a home service person and you want to follow one person, Tom is the real expert in this area. I would recommend him highly as a domain expert in HSAs. Okay, maybe in the Q and A uh, on the chat we can uh, we can share the link to that post uh, if someone's got it, and also link to uh, to Tom's profile uh, in on Twitter um, uh, or on the forum as well, uh, and you guys can follow that. That's great news, guys. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit much, a little bit more about HSAs uh, in the kind of pay to play section. So uh, let's go to I think this is uh, our final question. We've got one more in the chat session after this. Um, for a legal practice, this is a kind of practitioner uh, kind of question. Uh, for a legal practice, should we create a GMB listing for the practice and also separate listings for lawyers? Uh, how should we do this to avoid conflict uh, with each other? Um, Joe, Don't lawyers know? naturally fight with each other? <laughs> uh, from a GMB perspective, Joe, we get it. Me? Oh, I, I'm sorry. So I think. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I, I, I think you have to get on the same page as an organization of how you want to approach your listing management. I, I, yeah, I think if you certainly have lawyers in the same practice that are vying for each other's business, I mean, I, I think that's a business problem. <laughs> it's not just a listing problem. So it kind of goes, it goes beyond what's happening on local and you really have to figure out as a business how do I deal with that issue? Do I want to promote my individual lawyers or do I want to focus on the practice only so there's not infighting? And it's, it's, it's really how the business is structured. I, I think um, in many situations you have uh, practices where the lawyers have to go out and find their own business and they build so they're very, they're very keen on getting their own stuff done. I, I think as a result, if you're, if you're the lawyer in that situation that feels like they have to market themselves, um, uh, that's where practitioner listings actually benefit you because you could uh, very well create your own marketing strategy as a provider. Even if you're attached to a larger practice, you could have your own website and develop your own content and, and really compete against other practitioners in that space. But it's a business and problem before it's a listing problem. Okay. I say that's okay. Joy, do you want to follow on from that? Yeah, so my rule of thumb usually for this is don't bother creating more listings. Um, thing that I guess a lot of, uh, especially lawyers, don't realize is they don't own the listings they're creating. So let's say, Miles, you work for me and we, we have a law firm together, and then I create a listing for you, that's your listing. So if you decide that you're going to go start your own law firm later on, I don't get to say what happens to your listing. You can take it with you, update the address, and therefore all the people that, you know, were searching and leaving reviews for miles are technically, I'm going to lose all that as the business owner. So a lot of times for the firm itself, it does not make sense to create these listings um, for their staff, essentially, because it just means less control and more things you have to worry about if these people ever leave. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is it splits your reviews. So, I mean, it's usually better to have one profile that's really strong that has, you know, 100 reviews on it than to have four profiles that each have 25. Um, they most likely won't rank as strong. Um, the only time where I say, like, it's kind of an exception to the rules, if you've got attorneys that are really specialized in specific areas, 
So if we all were working at a law firm and Miles like focused on criminal law and Joel focused on personal injury, it could make sense to have a listing for Miles that um, you know had criminal lawyer as the uh, primary category and then Joel's would have like personal injury lawyer and they would both rank better for those specific keywords. I would suggest too that it, from a planning point of view, there's a lot of budget issues involved in this. Obviously more people that are doing this, the more expensive it is. And I think that each practice is slightly different. And then you have to factor in the fact that sometimes Google just gets a hair up its algorithmic butt and ranks the individual lawyer higher than the practice or vice versa. And so you have to sort of flex with the reality that is Google. So I think it really is a very individual and as Joel pointed out, a business case issue. So I think that it, uh, you have to sit down, understand the issues, and then create a plan that reflects those issues for the practice. Yeah, and Joy is right on that conceptually Google created, um, I think the first time we started talking about differences between, between practice and practitioner was with real estate agents who often moved around um, uh, groups. Uh, so so you'd, they'd be Remax one week and Century the other. And um, we wanted, and, and yet the real estate agent really was their brand of business. And they just happened to be associated with a larger entity. And uh, so it, it was made to increase portability of information between businesses, right? To allow providers to, or pra practitioners to move between businesses and take their listing information with them. Okay, guys, thank you. Let's move on uh, for the sake of time. Uh, last question in this section. Uh, I'm going to come to Mike with this one. Um, what should we prioritize for our clients' local strategies in 2018? Uh, what trends do you see growing for local search? A bit crystal ball question. So, you know, I'm a sort of traditional marketer, came out of a small business, family held, and to some extent, the traditional things that you did in business, Google is getting better at finding those, right? So the quality of your business, to me, is what you optimize for. The quality of the customer experience is what you optimize for. You don't optimize to get reviews. You optimize your business so that you earn reviews. And I think that's true with links and content and the way, and the way Google is moving. Google is a lot smarter. Um, so I, I think... The problem with the whole ranking game is it, it distorts our view of what's important. And ultimately, Google is getting better at sensing all of the things that we've traditionally said are important. You're standing in your community, i.e., how often are you recognized by the not-for-profits that are there? How often do you donate? Hopefully, you'll get links for it, or you want to be sure you get links for it, right? I mean, to some extent, you want to prioritize the basics of running a good business and then being sure that that's reflected online. Are you listed every place? You know, are your clients writing reviews about you because you earned it, right? So, but in the broader sense, if you look at where local is going, you know, it's a little impossible to predict the future, particularly with Google. But the idea that everybody's a mobile phone and everybody's searching from their phones, entities and often doing voice search or very limited uh, surface area for, for retrieving searches, entities are becoming increasingly important. So, building all those things we talked about the relevance of the entity, the reviews around the entity, the, you know, uh, the, uh, the social and semantic information around the entity, all that becomes increasingly important because Google needs and wants to do more granular searches. They want to know that you have gluten-free pizza at your pizza parlor. So I think one of the areas there is to look at Google's new tools, right, things like uh, posts, et cetera. Um, so, anyways, and you know, there's more behavioral signals too. I mean, with the move to mobile, Google is more aware what people are doing, and some of that you can't control directly, but some you can. If you do an offline ad and it brings a lot of people into your store and they're all carrying mobile phones, Google's going to know that. And I think that that ultimately those behavioral signals are going to play back in to uh, Google ranking. Okay, um, guys, we're going to move on to the next section. Thank you, Mike, for uh, kind of going to that. Um, pay to play is the uh, is the next section. Uh, and the first question, uh, I'm going to come to Joy with this one, is um, we have a listing that isn't showing up organically in the local pack, but our paid ad is there. Could paid ads in the map pack be stopping a listing from showing organically in the local pack? 
think this is like the age-old myth that AdWords and organic somehow, you know, impact each other. So easy answer, no. Um, you having an ad isn't going to make your local listing not show up. Um, what I try to aim to do for my clients is to get them on both. So I've got lots of cases where there's the ad and the three pack and then the traditional three results and you'll see like the same business will show up in the ad and they'll also be again in the three pack so they get like two out of the four spots, which is fabulous. Okay, great. I think uh, I think that's probably the answer we get from, from everyone uh, on that front. Let's go to the next question. Um, and Joel, come to this one. Um, what are the ranking factors for, for home service ads or HSAs, uh, as we kind of were describing earlier? Um, I've seen reviews and location are part of it. Does website authority or authority of a GMB listing have any effect on the position? So um, I, I, I have to tip my hat to Tom again. We've been talking a lot about Tom Wannington. He's really the expert here. I actually pinged him earlier just to get his uh, viewpoint on this, confirming some of my own thoughts. But um, I'm, I don't think website authority does have much of an impact. What um, I, the reviews certainly probably the fact that there are more um, the verified reviews that you can get through HASAs might have might be a factor. You also think about because this is ads optimization, the amount of spend in your budget is important. So uh, Tom recommends you know going out with a bigger budget and then dialing dialing it back as necessary. Um, also Google is measuring the leads you're getting and so your responsiveness to those leads is going is probably important too, right? Can you respond quickly based on the lead Google is delivering? That's probably going to have an impact on your ranking. So uh, this is more of an ads optimization question because it's likely that some of the traditional signals in uh, these ads aren't being used to rank them or to determine the quality of the ad. So you think about the quality of the ad unit. What are they trying to do in the ad unit and how do you optimize for that? And that's partly availability making sure your verified reviews are up there and added, that kind of stuff. You know, we're, we're seeing a trend here in this webinar and we're talking about basically the quality of the business itself and how it reflects itself to the real world. And I think, uh, I mean, Joel, that was awesome. Um, I think the only thing I would add to that is, is that potentially um, how many people take advantage of the Google guarantee that comes with the home service ads? How many people are basically redeeming that and saying, I want my money back, this company won't give me my money back, now Google has to give it back to me. So, um, I, again, I don't have a verification on that, but my hunch would be is that that probably is also a ranking factor. Okay, great guys, that's uh, a really good set of answers, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, it seems as though home service ads will be a Trump all kind of service. Does the rollout of HSAs mean that local SEA agencies are going to be need to change their service focus uh, in the future? Um, Joy, why don't you answer that for us, please? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it needs to change their focus as far as, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, having a storefront, storefront, <laughs> um, whether that's your home or an actual office. Um, other than that, I really don't see, you know, a huge impact. Um, it definitely would have an impact on AdWords. So if you're running an AdWords campaign and home service ads run out, or, sorry, get launched in the area, um, the ads that you are running obviously would, would definitely see an impact. So I think it's important for every single business to get involved in home service ads if it's in your area. Um, and because it's pay per lead, not pay per click, um, it should be, make sense for most businesses to get an ROI from it. Um, I think it's hard right now for agencies to be involved in home service ads because Google seems to be favoring a direct relationship with the business owner instead of a marketing company. They've promised us that they don't like hate marketing agencies, so I'm hoping that uh, we'll see less of those challenges later on. But yeah, this is challenging in that aspect right now. Um, okay, Joel, do you have any other uh, comments to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, just reiterating what I said before, I, um, that you have to think about, in general, this is an ad unit and how you optimize the signals going into that ad unit. And it's not typically the content on your website, but if you think about, if you think about the content in the ad unit that includes the reviews, then you might want to focus more on reviews than building up um, website content. You might want to think about 
again, those business process that allow people to answer those leads quickly, um, uh, and then making sure, as, as Ben mentioned, those leads uh, don't turn out to be um, bad experiences for those paying. Yeah, great, thanks. One final question uh, in this section. Now I'm going to come to Mike first with it. Is having more interactions and transactions, such as you know, observing tables, booking hotels, stuff, you know, transactions for services directly in the local pack, is that a good thing for local businesses? Um, yeah, they or, get more business, which or, is what we're all about here. Absolutely a good thing. Um, but do they end up paying uh, and being more beholden to Google? Uh, for that, rather than having those transactions happen off Google, and how does that affect your thoughts of SEO strategy, local SEO strategy in general? Well, so there's the big picture of Google wanting to give everybody the answer now, and so more and more there's a tendency to uh, for Google to make an effort to make their local search experience immersive and be able to answer the question. So whether you think it's good for the business or not is somewhat of an irrelevancy given that they're big and you're It's what's happening, right, it's the reality. So uh, that being said, I think the business needs to assess every one of these on an individual basis, putting in good metrics and making sure that they get what they expect to get out of it. Um, I see the local pack as increasingly taking business away from a website visit. So I see more and more transactions taking place there. So it does affect your local SEO strategy. I think you need to concern yourself. Like in the past, we've concerned ourselves with conversions on the website, which are still important. But I think now you need to worry about conversions on Google. If Google is going to put these, these conversion links there, then you need to be sure that at the moment of purchase, that your listing looks better than the next listing, that it has more reviews, that it has better pictures, that it has more comprehensive hours, it's better posts, more compelling content, because that's the chance you're going to get at the customer. So I think uh, Get Five Stars post um, about Google as your homepage sort of lays out my ideas about how you can shift into that mode of thinking where the decision is being made at Google. So you, are you saying there's less emphasis being put on websites? The businesses. Well, I'm saying that that Google still needs you to have a website, but the website becomes a data source for Google. So conversions are happening more on the front page of Google. People are coming to the front page of Google, clicking on the reservation, clicking on the click to call, clicking on the conversion at Google, and I think see this trend as having been over the last three or four years. Very Google knows what people are doing and they want to provide that answer. So if that's the reality, if people are making that decision right there. In the case study I did, 70% of all digital conversions were occurring. That includes Facebook, website, Yelp, everything. 70% of them were occurring on the front page of Google. People were stopping there and clicking the click to call or whatever the call to action was. In this case, it was click to call. So. This is the reality, and that means that you need to be aware that it's the reality and counsel the business or, or the business needs to take action to make them as con conversion intense as possible on the front page of Google. Okay, Mike, that's great, thank you. Um, well, listen, we're going to run a little bit beyond, guys. Uh, I'm going to go to the next section, which is uh, looking at ranking factors. and. Um, Joy, this one is going to come to you. Does the proximity of search to business beat all other factors? Uh, and does location have the same level of impact for all industries in all cities? Yeah, yeah so like, it's really important for people to realize that you know, proximity of the searcher, so that meaning the, the searcher's location, where I'm located when I'm searching, is definitely the strongest ranking factor out of all of them. But that doesn't mean that when you search on Google, you're going to get a list in order of who's closest to you. Um, the fact is there are hundreds of ranking signals. So I think of it like a big puzzle. When you got like a 200 piece puzzle and although the proximity might be a bigger, larger piece, there are still a million other pieces. So if you've got all kinds of other things going on for you, um, that can definitely help you rank higher even if you're not the closest to the searcher. Um, 
That being said, it was the number one ranking factor that everyone voted on last year on Moz's local search ranking factors, and I do see it as the number one thing that kind of trumps or is a stronger ranking factor than anything else. Right. Uh, basically, the second thing, though, I was going to point out that um, there are certain industries where it seems to have a much stronger impact. So, like dentists, for example, are very hyper local. Um, so, I was doing a consultation with a dentist, um, and they were scanning from like the city center when they were checking their ranking. So, I suggest, especially with like an uh, industry like dentists, scan from the zip code instead if you want to get an accurate picture of what um, people would see if they're around your area. Um, just because it, it changes so drastically based on whatever zip codes that you're you're in when you're searching. Why do you think uh, that as an, as an industry is affected differently to others? Dentists, I think, it's just because there's so many of them. Like even the smallest town has like <laughs> dozens of dentist offices. They're everywhere. Um, so because Google has so many quality places to choose from, they they can do that, right? They can be picky because um, there's just so much competition. Mike, anything you'd like to add from those comments? Um, yeah, city, it's density dependent, city dependent, it's industry dependent. It's going to vary in a broad sense. It's the same, but what the, the stuff you mix in isn't the same, right? So, um, and my response to this proximity thing is it's the number one ranking factor until it isn't. I mean, Joy has seen examples of SEOs in Toronto who are in the suburbs who, who – Manipulated their link profile, who manipulated their business name, and were at the one box in downtown Toronto, even though they were in the suburbs. So clearly, there are variables that can overweight proximity, but generally, proximity. Most people, as Ben said, want to do business with something closer, and Google is acknowledging that. Um, John, I might just bring you in on this because I guess you know, I had another kind of questions that we didn't sort of bring through. Is it like, you know, why is Google put such emphasis on proximity for things like dentists, where actually, you know, people are happy to travel further for a quality provider, you know, as opposed to a gas station when you need gas, you want the, you want the closest one. Okay. What, do you, what do you think is kind of Google's thinking behind applying proximity as a filter for industries that proximity really shouldn't matter that much for? Um, so I, I think sometimes SEOs get a little bit hung up about proximity um, in the sense that uh, the user, it's proximity to that user, like Mike said. So it's not, it's not necessarily proximity to the, lo to the location they're using to test. And, that, and I, I think just by the very nature that this is, this is fallen on the lap of the Maps team at Google, that they're very map oriented. So distance, they think a lot about distances. They always think about how fast does it take to drive somewhere? How can you make that more efficient? What signals go into that? So, so there, there is a clear like map, map view bias when thinking about local search and how maps um, influence the local search. So I, I think that when in the early days, local search was kind of separate from maps and they joined up and really created one product, it really biased towards this map-centric view. So they did things um, in search to uh, make sure that they did this thing a while ago um, called distance flattening, which means that if you're searching on a viewport, and you only really see this on Google Maps now, but if you're searching on a certain viewport, they're trying to get you rankings over that viewport as best as they can, not necessarily to the center point of that viewport but they're trying to do a ranking across that entire viewport. So again, a very map biased search rank because this has just grown up in the, in the geo and mapping team. I also heard an engineer speaking on this topic. He was an NPR a couple years ago and he said that they did these experiments where they reduced and reduced and reduced until people started screaming and then they, they opened it up. So this is clearly something that Google tests and they have a sense of click-through rates and satisfaction rates and all the other metrics that one would consider. So it certainly doesn't meet the SEO's approval, but it apparently meets consumers and Google's approval. Okay. Great, guys. Thank you. Really detailed answers for that, uh, that question. Um, next question is, and who's this one going to come to? Uh, ben, uh, do you think regular blogging uh, helps local businesses rank better? Talk about semantic search. Uh, and will content marketing continue to help in local SEO? 
So <clears throat> I think that the, the shortest way to answer this is going to be yes. Um, having a regular content flow on your website, especially if you're authoritative uh, about the topic, is very helpful. Um, but we still come back to the whole issue of business itself is, you know, uh, do you have the time or can you provide basically answers to uh, questions that, say, prospects are going to have? And I think that's the really the most important aspect of it is, is that when you're blogging, you should be always seeking to answer questions before your customers have even asked it. Um, so yes, just, I think that content marketing does help with local SEO. It absolutely sends a signal. And also on top of that, if you're, you know, again, from a semantic standpoint, trying to tie together pieces of information that are around the web, say, you know, the top 10 things uh, to think about when you're hiring a plumber and you find a great article on Forbes that you can cite and maybe pull a quote out of. Uh, those types of things can help and influence kind of the, the semantic relevance of your website and therefore that transfers back to your local SEO. Um, Joy, when you're um, kind of working with your kind of customers and you kind of talk about content, how much do you sort of focus your I guess, attention on ranking versus the conversion impact that content can have? Yeah, so I mean for, for my clients on their monthly reports, the, the only thing I really report on month over month is conversions because that's really all that matters. Like I really don't care if, uh, you know, I got a client ranked for some random new keyword that uh, doesn't actually result in a phone call or contact form submission. So I think I've seen a lot of people in the local SEO space do this wrong for a long time. They obsess about rankings and traffic and those are all great metrics um, that I use internally, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all about conversions. So I think that content marketing is good, um, and I think it helps drive um, ranking up, but um, I also think it's something where you can spend too much time on it. Often posting content doesn't have a huge um, impact on conversions in the sense of like, you know, you write an article, you're a dentist and you write an article on teeth whitening, that article is probably not going to result in 15 more phone calls. Um, however, that article can help drive up your ranking for like core dentist keywords and that would drive more phone calls. So kind of take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, next question. Um, and again, I think it's one to, uh, um, to Ben. Um, how much of an impact does, does the landing page that you link to from your GMB profile have on the local search rankings? Um, what we offer that first, then we can look at the multi-location bit. So how much of an impact is that to the choice of the landing page you link to have on your rankings in GMB? Yeah, I actually think it's kind of a two-part question because I, I believe the intent of the question is when they're talking about GMB landing web page, they might be talking about the website feature that is the new website feature that's launched within Google My Business. Um, so if that was the intent of the question, the answer to that's going to be that the GMB website uh, is not going to help you from a ranking perspective whatsoever. It was meant to just help businesses that don't have web presence. I was watching kind of in the chat and somebody had said they had a, uh, it was a bike shop, but you know, something like that, but they didn't have a website. So can they use GMB website? You know, uh, and absolutely, that was what, exactly what it was intended for. For multi-location, uh, the answer to that really, I think is also very simple. Um, number one, is it best to use the home page for multi-location? I think the answer is absolutely no. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Joy, but that's actually one of the things that the Possum filter actually looks for when you have multi-location is that using the actual local landing page or a location page itself is really a best practice these days. Joy, do you like, uh sort of disapprove or uh, confirm Ben's comment? Um, so I, maybe I'm missing, okay, so you're you're saying that the filter is filtering based on what URL um, you're using? Well, I'm right, so basically, yeah, so basically if you were had, let's say, uh, two offices and those offices were just down the block from each other and instead you had both of those offices linking to the home page versus linking to a location page, then the possum filter could basically, in a sense, maybe filter out one of those locations because it's both going to the home page. 
So it doesn't um, do it based on, I don't think it does it based on the single page, but definitely by domain. So um, we'll see lots of businesses where they have like, you know, 15 websites for some reason. And um, sometimes they can escape the filter by creating fake listings using a different domain, a different phone number, but usually they also have to have a different address as well. Um, and I've definitely seen listings get filtered out that were at different locations because they share the same domain. Um, I think, again, Google's just trying to keep one company from monopolizing the results, so they, they do do that. Okay. Um, okay, great. Let's uh, next question and uh, see who I think of this one for. Um, uh, I think, uh, Mike, let's get this one. Are there any advanced tactics we can use to hyper-optimize uh, GMB um, profiles? I should say profiles there. Things like keyword labeling and middle. Right. So, from my point of view, the optimization the, is conversion optimization of the GMB. The goal of the GMB, to me, is to be incredibly valuable to the end users so that they click your website, click the call, or click on driving directions. Um, I don't... Uh, certainly adding more nuance so that Google understands the business better is always helpful. So, I think Google Posts adds nuance. I don't know that it's an advanced tactic. It provides Google with more information about your business and it's always better to give them more information about your business. I think Google Q&A might someday do the same thing. Um, I think having reviews would do the same thing. I don't think replying to reviews with geoterms has any impact. I don't think that there's much that you can do in the GMB in the days, I mean, other than changing your business name, that and that's not an advanced tactic, that's a dumb tactic, but it's a tactic, is change your business name to impact your rank. Um, keyword labeling images, eh, no, no impact. Um, replying to reviews, no impact. So, but I, I think you want to think about the GMB in terms of optimizing the customer experience maximizing the likelihood they're going to click you rather than the next guy, which means great photos, great reviews, compelling posts, making sure you fill out all the attributes. I've found uses the attributes that they're assigning to you in, in search, for example, uh, whether it's handicapped accessible. And if somebody's searching on whether you're handicapped accessible, you show up. And if you don't have the attribute, not. Nah. So I wouldn't stress too much about the GMB from a ranking point of view. I'd stress about it from a consumer uh, approval benefit point of view. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. And that kind of actually kind of flows not quite nicely into the final section, which is around kind of Google My Business features, some of the new features um, that are available within there. Um, Joy, a question for you. Have you seen that adding a post in GMB helps uh, website rankings or improve visibility? And I've it says website ranks, I'm I think they're probably meant for uh, the local pack uh, ranking specifically. Uh, have you seen any impact or around the velocity, the quantity, the text used in posts having any impact? Yeah, so it's actually funny that this came up as a question because this is something that um, I've actually been testing on a couple of locations with um, Ben's company. So Ben's company, uh, City Demand, basically they've been doing some posting on a couple listings and we purposely chose listings that didn't have a lot going on. Um, so like one of them was my church. I can safely say my church doesn't invest in SEO or do much to improve their presence online. Um, so we were just wondering, you know, if we start doing active posting, what would be the impact? Um, so I'm going to be sharing the, like, full details of what we've seen at Local U Advanced in November. So huge shout out to uh, <laughs> people to join that if, if you can make it. Um, I'm going to be speaking, Joel's going to be speaking, Mike's going to be speaking. Um, it's going to be a great event. But essentially, like in a nutshell, yes, we have seen some impact in what um, has been happening with ranking as a result of posting because these businesses aren't doing anything else. So um, I think it, it definitely can have an impact. Can you kind of quantify the impact that you've seen in any, in any, in any way in terms of movement in, in, in rankings or uh, kind yeah. of traffic? Yeah, I think Go for it. Yeah, well, then you can add to it. But yeah, it has made an impact in ranking. I think the key thing that people need to realize here, though, is I think the impact it's making is more to do with engagement on the post and interest in the post than, you know, shoving a bunch of keywords in there. 
So I don't think if you're um, a plumber and you want to rank for plumbing, you should just create a bunch of posts that say, best plumber ever, call us for plumbing, over and over and over again. Um, that's definitely not what we've been doing with this test. Um, all the posts were, you know, interesting things <laughs> that would catch people's attention. I don't know, Ben, if you want to add to that. <laughs> well, I mean, basically during the test, what we did is we utilized the same exact techniques that we're using when we do uh, anything within Google+. The thing that you're missing when it comes to posts is really any kind of engagement, at least that could be a good metric, because really all you have is views and then the number of times the call to action itself has been clicked. Um, so, but by using the same kind of methodology, which is kind of, again, more serving the the user uh, than anything else, but using kind of more of a semantic type of style of content, uh, not just inserting keywords, but inserting information that's very relevant to the business, very relevant to the user itself, um, you know, and tying that information again with other pieces of data around the web of what people are looking for. So the, the results, I think, well, Joy, Joy, of course, will be showing these results at Local U, but um, I would say that for, uh, as a good takeaway is that from, at least what we've from, seen from the test is, is that uh, you can see some good minor bumps, basically, coming in, and some, actually, you can grab some new keywords just by using posts and, and writing the content, more importantly, in the right way uh, to put that last part into perspective when we're writing these posts during the test we used again that same formula with g plus and we were doing about approximately i think uh, we were well we were using up as much as we could 300 words basically within the post and then really optimizing the first 100 characters for the user experience okay great that's really interesting i'm looking forward to uh to seeing the results of that maybe joy you'll share them with a wider group uh, if we're not able to uh, to be in santa monica uh, for that event in November. Um, next question, and um, Joy, one for you. Do you think that regularly updating uh, a GMB listing, such as posts, you know, uh, or links, images, services, actually kind of going in there, um, showing you know a pulse within the listing, um, gives a boost to kind of pack or match results? And if it does, um, what does that last for? And do you have a any kind of I guess um, sort of sense of the frequency and the types of actions that uh, businesses should be encouraged to do? within that listing? Yeah, so yes and no. Uh, I think it definitely has an indirect um, impact on ranking because having a more full profile, like having lots of photos and having um, a menu, I think that leads to a higher click-through rate and a higher click-through rate will definitely help ranking. Um, but I think it's like Mike said earlier, um, going into Google My Business and adding all kinds of crap is not really the main thing that's going to move the needle. Um, when it comes to ranking, so it's really important that people aren't just doing that and thinking that, okay, I'm done. Um, the other added benefit to updating the listing constantly is it helps the listing's um, strength a bit. And what I mean by that is like if a competitor is trying to submit an edit on your listing or a user submits an edit on your listing, it is less likely that that edit will go through if it is a listing that is regularly managed and edited. Um, if it's a listing that's been floating around in, in Google My Business for two years and hasn't been touched, Google's more likely to think, okay, the business owner is not actively engaging or monitoring their data, therefore it's more likely that the data could be incorrect and they're more likely to approve a edit um, to a listing in that state, based on my experience anyway. Right, actually leads us nicely on to the next question, which I'm going to put uh, Mike's way, which is, what are the data sources that Google now gets its listing data from? Um, you know, which, which do you think they trust the most? I think it's uh, in a, I think anything that's verified, so for example, InfoUSA goes through the trouble of making sure that the business really is where they are. So any data source that's verified, Google knows it's verified, high degree of trust. InfoUSA, Better Business Bureau, if you're, uh, and I think in in sub-industries, professional licensing uh, sources that Google can see, I think, help. So anything that Google has confidence in that they, the business source has gone out and verified the information, I think those have a, a biggest impact. And then ones that, um, like Yelp, that spent that 
actually transfer page prominence down to the local listing and have a high degree of local content that Google, you know, over the years has trusted. So this is a good example of a local resource that's a general resource that has a lot of impact. Um, we don't know what the impact of the, like InfoUSA or Axiom is on a listing, but it's easy enough these days to be sure that you're listed everywhere. Um, so it, I doubt that that has it sort of table stakes is being listed everywhere. Um, but I, I would say, like I said, Better Business Bureau, industry specific approval sites, I would put a lot of emphasis on and review sites that Google looks at. Okay, great. Um, uh, we are over time, so let's go to our last question, um, which is a bit of a big one, actually. Um, Joel, what is the next big change or evolution going to be for Google My Business? Um, I think evolutionarily, they will uh, they will continue to work on features that you're seeing in Maps, giving business owners a little bit more control, if not a little bit more say in what's happening on Maps. So you you could think of a of a feature like Q and A being added to to a man, uh, as a management interface within. Um, Google My Business in the same way that you have reviews there today. Um, uh, we we don't have it. We we were all in a meeting I think last week, and I asked this question to one of the Google PMs, and his answer was, um, "We don't talk about that stuff." So uh, uh, it was very satisfying, right? No, and, and um, but I think ultimately the reason Google, uh, the strategic reason Google has Google My Business is one, to get data correct on Google Maps. So anything that's going to entice people to come into that interface to supply them with the correct data is, uh, is something they're going to focus on. Additionally, a kind of a secondary usage is, hey, we have all these people here, what can we sell them? So um, uh, as long as it doesn't interfere or block um, the primary purpose of getting data, uh, Google will use Google My Business to sell SMBs and large chains things that they might find useful um, to better their business. Whether that's from a business perspective of selling an ad, Google's bread and butter, or maybe additional services. And, and we saw a little bit about of this a few years ago when they talked about this concept of business builder um, uh, and uh, what are all these different services they can add. They're actually kind of executing on that today in a way um, that they never quite realized back when it was first talked about. By creating a suite of tools that a small business could use, um, and, and I could see this going beyond what Google does. So now everything is very focused on posting to the knowledge panel, post um, giving information that's on Google within the ecosystem. You could see Google My Business becoming the standard tool for a small business, and particularly, maybe not in the US, but if you look at India, Brazil, Indonesia, can they get tools so they can, so they can sell stuff better, so that they, can, they have a point of sale right in their business? If they, all these kind of tools that you need to get your business going, can Google My Business really fill the gap there? so that someone can log into Google My Business, start a business, and start running. Probably not in the US, probably not in developed markets, but you might see this happening more and more. And you kind of see it on the website development side of what can Google My Business do to really satisfy all this small business needs. Do you, given all the evolutions, uh, or the revolutions in fact, that uh, you know, Google, Google's local business sort of platform has been through, do you get a sense that they are much happier with where they are now than the days when every two years they'd rebrand, relaunch something. Do you feel that they've, they've, they feel that they've, they've got a platform that is, can, they can build on, add to in the future, and just make it better as opposed to changing tack again and doing something different? Yeah, I think things have stabilized in terms of how they view local search and how they take ownership of that data. Before it was really, it was more of a web model where we go out, we find information other places, and we display it on our services. Today, it's much more of a we take ownership. This is, this is Google's data. 
and we're going to manage it. And that has allowed them to be a lot more flexible in the data models that they're using for, um, for local search. And I, 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 don't, I don't see a change in tactics there. Great. Um, I think that is probably all we've got time for, guys. We've run 15 minutes over. So um, huge thanks to, to all of you um, for, uh, for an incredible set of answers. None of D7 gone through. It's been incredible. Uh, I could, you know, I've got a, a contact team here who's furiously writing up answers to some questions that have come through in the text, but also uh, in the roundup of this. It's, uh, it's been a hell of an exercise. So thank you very much. Um, before we wrap up, um, uh, just a quick word from Mike uh, or Joy about the, the local you advance session. Uh, that's happening in Santa Monica. Um, sure. You guys want to say a few words about that? Yeah. So, local you advance was created as a cooperative amongst ethical local SCs who felt that it was important to educate people about sustainable, leading-edge local search tactics. And we've, over the years, in fact, I know Joel got his current job uh, through being at one of these events. So it's a great networking event. And it's also some of the best speakers. Darren Shaw is going to be there, Joy, Joel, um, Aaron Weike, Mike Ramsey, um, Megan Hene, who does a great job on sort of not-for-profit relationships with business. So it's a, it's a very relaxed environment. Um, and one of the, I, it's my most, it, even though I run it, I guess I'm biased, but it's the most educational and enjoyable local event I go to every year. I look forward to locally advanced whenever it occurs. So, and this one's being hosted by Patient Pop. Uh, they're helping us put it on in in Santa Monica. So it's a beautiful setting and a really nice old building. We're going to have a the night before we have a meet and greet where lots of IPAs and other types of beers. Uh, I think Joel gets the order list down correctly. And um, <laughs> I it should be a great. I all need input on that, but yeah, yeah. Go ahead and tweet. What you want to drink at local U Advance. <laughs> so, anyways, and a chance, and Google's going to be sending two representatives as well. So, it's a chance not just to meet old ex Google employees like Joel. It's a chance to meet Joy and myself, but also the a couple people from Mercer Nordahl and and Allison from uh, the team. So it's and have your problem right in there. So it's kind of cool. All right. Well, listen, we'll send a tweet out about that with the uh, the GMB uh, webinar hashtag as well. And as a uh, you. Currently, kind of given a, a fifty dollars discount with the promo code Bright Local. Sadly, we won't be able to join you uh, based in the UK, um, Santa Monica. We can only look dreamily on uh, at the weather and the content uh, you guys are going to experience on that day. So, I hope everyone can make it uh, who's in the vicinity or can travel to it. So, guys, um, we've overrun. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your brilliance. Uh, I've loved it. I've absolutely uh, loved this event and the one last week. Um, there's so much to absorb and take on board. Uh, you've been incredibly generous with your time and your expertise. Thank you, everyone, for listening in uh, and for sharing that time. We'll aim to get this uh, video um, downloaded, wrapped up, re-uploaded again uh, tomorrow to the Bright Local blog. We'll also share it uh, on various uh, kind of video platforms and with the uh, four speakers. And uh, I hope we get to do this again sometime very soon. But wherever you are, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.